Well, whenever you go to a movie, whenever I go to a movie, if you get there early enough, uh, this is one of the reasons I like going to the theater. Before the feature film starts, there are previews of coming attractions. And a lot of times I'm making decisions in that moment of I'll see that one or nope, got no interest in that. You know, it's like uh, I think I'll go get popcorn during the preview. So if you're thinking, you know, hey, these previews, if the preview is great, I know the movie is going to be greater. And if the preview is not so hot, then I'm like, if those are the highlights, then I don't need to see the rest of the movie. Right. And so when you think about these selected scenes, what they're trying to do is give you a, a hunger, right, a desire to see the whole picture, to see the whole story, to see what's coming next. And so I think we all know the preview doesn't show the whole story. I mean, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be that all the great jokes from a comedy are in the preview. If you go then see the whole movie, you're like, yeah, I already laughed at that one in the preview for free. Uh, but you know, why did I pay for the whole movie? You actually want them to give you a little taste, but, but it, it should have even more, it doesn't divulge every detail. There shouldn't be a spoiler in the, in the uh, trailer that is like, well, here's what happens, you know, the hero dies or, or whatever, and you're like, what? Um, so there's always something that a, a trailer does or is supposed to do, what a preview does, is give you that coming attraction, coming attraction but it should attract you to come, right? I mean, that's the idea of, of what it is. And so you get glimpses of who the different stars might be, and I think of different ones that just gave you the slightest hint that, yes, that person will be back, right? In this, it's like you just see like a little, and you're like, was that them? I don't know. They were hooded. It was dark. I'm not sure. Come see the movie, right? I mean, that's the idea. So the point of a preview is to build anticipation, and some of you even now are thinking, I know Solo's already out. It's out this weekend. Don't tell me anything about it because Tuesday is the cheap day, you know? And, and our family, we, we fight this internal war all the time, which is, should we see it on opening weekend or should we wait for the matinee? And it's like, uh, wait for the matinee. Just don't talk to anyone. That's our opening weekend is Tuesday on cheap day, right? But it's to build anticipation of something that you've looked forward to. And to leave you wanting more, to leave you wanting to see more and to know more. And previews kind of always end with that promise that you see up here on the screen, which is coming soon. Coming attraction, you know, coming soon. It, it, it's not forever that you're going to have to wait. It can feel like that in the interim. And the message is you don't want to miss this movie when it actually shows. And by showing a preview, the theater is hoping that something will be said in your heart, which is, I'm counting the days until that comes. When is it? Circle it. Go home and circle it on my calendar and say, yes, circle days. You know, those things matter to me. I have things right now that are coming attractions in my life, right, that, that help me maybe get through a time that is just a grind. You know, I'm grinded. But why? Well, <laughs> oh, I got that coming attraction. I'm looking forward to that. I definitely want to see that. And it's not just movies for me. It's life events. But there's so many times that I'll say, ah, it's worth going through this to get to that. And so today we see in the scriptures a preview, not of a movie, but of the Messiah. See, when you think about this, that's one of the many names that Jesus goes under. But it means the anointed one. That's what Messiah means. But he was a messenger, right? He was a master. <laughs> one of the great masters is what some people think. But he was the master. When you think about what we see in Mark 9, it has been a case being uh, built throughout these chapters that there's a, a guy who came that's unique in history, right? That, that he's not just one of many greats, but he is the greatest of all. And so when you wrestle through that thought, there's something else that is maybe woven through this, but not always as obvious, which is that there's a sequel to his coming, right? There's a second part to this story. There's a phase that goes beyond what we're seeing right here in the Gospels. So the interesting thing is, the disciples who were there at the moment, in the moment, thousands of years ago, well, they were having trouble even understanding that the, 
the plot line that Jesus was giving them because he was describing to them both the original and the sequel at the same time. And they were going like, I don't even get this plot, right? I don't know if you've watched movies like this. My family knows one of my favorite buttons is the pause button. Pause. <laughs> wait a minute, is this guy the same guy that was in the first part? And it's like, his hair looks different. And they're like, Dad, it's 25 years later. His hair looks different. I'm like, okay, thank you. Um, like, we can keep going. You know, they, they know. It's just painful to watch a movie with me. Come, wait, wait, wait. But you're saying that, it, it, is this scene from before? And they're like, Dad, it's called a flashback. Just hit the, you know, keep going, you know. And so I'm just painful to watch a movie with. Don't do it with me. That's part of the reason I can't really watch them in theaters very effectively. Because uh, I, I, I'm that guy, right? I'm that guy you do not want to sit by. I'm like, where's the pause button? But today you'll see in the scriptures a preview. And, and you're going to see some things that you go, well, man, I'm not sure I fully understand that. Well, can I be a... a, a honest pastor and say, I don't, I don't understand some of these things, but I sure want to see the movie. I want to see the rest of the story, and I intend to do so. And so when I see this part one of Mark 9 is a sneak preview of the second coming of Christ, and it gives us just a little glimpse of what's to come, the glory that's to come. And in these first few verses of Mark 9, this is what's commonly called the transfiguration. This is something called the transfiguration. So if you were going to run it as a movie, you'd say, you know, coming soon, the transfiguration, and you know, Lucas film and stuff, and rumbling music and all that kind of stuff. But Jesus, in this little preview, shone like the sun. I mean, it was a very bright scene. The glory of God radiated from within a person and out of that person that guys were used to kind of seeing him as just a really superhuman, right? He's so amazing as a person, but again, there was something shining through this guy that they hadn't seen before. And there's even an audible voice from heaven. I don't know what it sounded like, but I'm sure it was very impressive. It says, this is my son, listen to him. All right, so that, that would be pretty impressive. If, it, if I was out at a picnic with my wife and I'm blah, blah, blahing, and all of a sudden the heavens opened up and he said, this is my daughter, listen to her. I'd be like, <laughs> okay, so Glenn, what's on your mind? You know what you got? Um, I'd like to hear your perspective on things. And so that's a strong endorsement. And what's the point of the preview? Again, God wants to build anticipation in the lives of those who were following him then the people who are following him now. See, he wanted the disciples to say in their hearts, I can't wait for the kingdom of God to come. I can't wait for eternity. I'm looking forward to it. I got it circled on my calendar, so to speak. I will be there. I'm not going to miss that. I want to see that. And the coming attractions were for his closest companions. I love this because Peter, James, and John are the ones who got to go. And you might immediately think, oh, favoritism. But I, as a teacher, a school teacher, know the favorites. You know what we're talking about here. You put the three desks right in front of you and say, you're going to sit right there. Um, the ones you keep closest to you are the ones who keep spacing out, right? The ones who are like, whoa, 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 let's get in close. So don't be thinking that Peter, James, and John were these elite, wonderful, got all the answers type of people. They might have been the teacher's pet, but it's because the, they pretty much thought like a dog most of the time. And so the preview came with a promise, and he kept telling them the same thing. I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. It'll be worth the wait. And they went, duh, what? And he made it so impressive that they went, I don't want to miss that. I will be there. I will do whatever I need to do to be there. And so we've seen so far in Mark that Jesus' closest friends misunderstood his mission. They misunderstood his first coming. They misunderstood that he was coming again. And that some of the things that were going to be fulfilled were fulfilled first. And then there's things that are yet to be fulfilled. And they knew he was the king of kings, uh, sort of. But they were hoping he would be the king of the region they were in, right? That they would get rid of Rome. And I've said that many times, but it's such an important thing to do because they physically focused just like we do. They thought here and now is what you need to fix, God. And he was always like, I'm taking you to a there and then. This whole little thing you're doing here, whether you get 70, 80, 90, or even 100 years, every once in a while I see the oldest person died and someone else is behind them, you know, 114, and they're still going and stuff. But you still go, hey, that's a little time on the, on the human stage. 
And he says, this is just a preview. This is just a coming attraction. It's a, it's a thing that you get a little dress rehearsal, a little taste of what's to come. And so they had heard his words, but you know that they missed a lot of them. Remember what he said last week, if you were here, I'll review it for you quickly. He said, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. But here's the thing, they checked out the minute they didn't like the first thing in the preview. He said, I'm going to suffer. Whoa, I'm not listening to this guy. I'm going to be rejected. I don't I reject that. I don't want to be rejected. And so they actually didn't hear the best part. And he said, and in the sequel here, let me tell you a little spoiler for the sequel. I will rise again and you will rise again with me and we will be forever together. And they went, huh? I didn't even hear that part. And so Peter rebuked Jesus. Isn't this a great thought? One of his followers said, no, 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 God. Uh, I've got a better understanding than you do. I, I know a little more about it. And remember, Jesus has seen all of the movies, right? You get that? Somebody who's never seen certain parts of movies will tell you things, and you're like, <laughs> you haven't seen part eight, apparently, because in part eight, all those people come back to life, right? Um, it's like, no, they're all dead, dead, dead. And you're like, no. They're not. Um, and so when I think about <laughs> what that means to us, Jesus then rebukes Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. Now, that's a little rough to hear that, you know, but, but he's really talking to the source behind Peter and saying, you're not listening to God right now. You're listening to something else. And so Jesus gives him a wake-up call, and I love it. This, this in this phase, and we get right into it right now, Mark chapter 9, verse 1. If you'll look at it with me, and if you'll go home and think about these things, I think it'll do a lot for your life like it will for mine as well. These previews here, this is what I wrote down, is that they are for all audiences. What do I mean by that? Well, there's, this is something everyone ought to know. Man, if you go through life without understanding that this is just the little glimpse before the glory... You're going to get so focused on the here and now, you will hate this life. You'll get down on this life because it's got its ups and downs, but this is not the way the story ends. This isn't the way the story ends. This is just one tiny chapter in one little page off in the corner of the galaxy. And so when you think about this, it helps us understand it. It's easy to forget that, right? I mean, that's the bedrock thought of my faith is that there's more to life than this life. But you see in verse one, Jesus said to them, assuredly, I say to you that there's some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now that right there is an interesting thought because he's basically telling them, you'll see this in your lifetime. You're going to see something pretty amazing in your lifetime. Now, over the centuries, obviously that was written a long time ago, and there's people who just look at the Bible like real quickly, take a verse out of context, and they say to themselves, oh, see, Jesus gave them a promise he didn't fulfill. He said he was going to do this, and he didn't do it. They all tasted death. I mean, Peter isn't still here. Uh, James and John, they're gone, right? But think about this. I actually had a guy that I was you know, sharing my faith with, uh, a friend, and I wasn't doing it like, you know, with that notch on my Bible type of thing. I was just sharing with him some of the things God was doing in my life. He said, well, my problem is I'd love to believe the Bible, but I can't because it's full of an inaccuracies and lies. I said, oh, it is? Um, and do you know any? He said, yeah, yeah, like, like I was in this class, in this comparative religions class, and this professor talked about this one place where Jesus had told his followers, um, you know, I'm coming back in your lifetime, and the end of the world will come in your lifetime. And he, he said, I don't know where it is, but it's in there somewhere. And he was talking about this passage. But this is what's interesting. Skeptics will look at this and suggest Jesus was wrong. But I think if you'll look at the passage, you'll realize he was right. In fact, it was closer than, than anyone imagined, because verse 2 says, now after six days, Jesus took Peter and James and John and led them up on a high mountain. The fulfillment of what he just said in verse 1 is fulfilled six days later in this preview. At, to me, sometimes the most obvious of all interpretations is the most obvious interpretation. And people go through these convoluted things where they're like, uh, they'll believe a weird interpretation of something other than the plain and obvious meaning of it. And to me, I look at it, he didn't say that the end of the world would come. He said, you're going to see the kingdom of God present in power. You're going to be standing there when you're going to see 
a burst through of eternity into right now. And he says, you ain't dying before that. They didn't know it was going to be six days later, but it was. He didn't say, I'll return with the angels and end this whole thing. He didn't say any of that. What he said was, you're about to see something very, very powerful, and you ain't going to die till you do it. And so he leads him up on this mountain, apart by themselves. He was transfigured before them. And verse 3 says, his clothes became shining, exceedingly white, like snow, like no launderer on earth can whiten them. Now, I could go into all kinds of stupid stories about how I've tried to clean clothes and made them worse, but you've already heard those stories. So let's get on to the important stuff, which is this. Six days after this promise to show the kingdom of God present with power, he takes three of them on a little hike, and he does a preview of his glory, and he could have done it anywhere. He could have done it right where they were, right? You know this. Uh, one of the things I think is interesting about Jesus' miracles is the context around them, because He'll sometimes ask, hey, hand me that, and then he'd do a cool miracle with it, but he didn't need that, right? You understand that if, if a guy can speak the world and the universe into existence, he can speak anything into existence, but he's always taking someone into a context that gives him a better understanding, right? There's a story to this stuff, and what he does is he takes him up from the valley to the mountaintop to do something, and I don't know about you, but... Metaphorically speaking, you know, emotionally and spiritually speaking, there are valleys of life and there are mountaintops of life. And you may have heard the phrase, but it says, don't forget in the valley what you learned on the mountain, right? I, and, and it's so easy to do this, to go through something in life where you're not seeing the manifest glory of God, you know, shining around. And yet they needed to hang on to this. He knew they were going to go through an extraordinarily difficult time before they got to see the whole movie, right? I can guarantee you, Peter, James, and John have seen the whole movie, right? They know all of what eternity means. They're in it right now. But they were gonna go through some very difficult times between Jesus' uh, coming back for them and them going on to follow him. And so he takes them up for this lesson. And I love the long range view, a different perspective. I love that about the mountains. I've gone to the mountaintops and seen some things that helped sustain me through other times, you know? And I mean that both physically and spiritually. And Peter, James, and John are totally alone with Jesus. They're far away from the crowds. They're even away from the other disciples. It's kind of like he takes them to a little dark little theater and says, I got a private showing for you. you got, I want to show you what's coming because it's so important for you to know this because you will give up if you don't know this. And if you have a pen or you have a, a mental way of writing things down, metamorphosis is the word behind transfiguration. When he talks about that, it's a Greek word, metamorphosis, right? And metamorphosis is the word we use for a changing of a caterpillar to a butterfly. It's a fundamental change of character, but it's connected to the thing. Remember, if you squish the, the, the caterpillar and it ceases to exist completely, uh, there won't be a butterfly coming out the other side of that. There is actually a connection through that cocoon and through that process, right? There's a continuity to it, but at the same time, there's a foundational difference between those two things. And this is what it says. It says Jesus was metamorphosis in front of them. You know, that they, they got to see a, a, an invasion of eternity into right now. Because Jesus, when he was here, was veiled, right? He was covered. He was very human looking. And so internal change here and the external change bursts out, a radical transformation. Again, you might look at that and say, man, this is weird, Scott. Not, no, this is weird. I, I'm, not weird. I'm not weird. I'm a person. Well, I'm, I'm my own kind of weird, just like you are. But do I struggle to believe this? Yes, I struggle to believe this. Are there times where I go, I don't know. Yeah, there are. But then when I see the complexity of this little preview, I realize... I wouldn't put anything past the movie maker. I mean, seriously, have you looked around? Have you thought for a moment that each one of us are like the result of, of a little collision between the, the, a cell that's the only cell that's visible, a single cell, and boom, and, blah, 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 and then you, you're you, and you get to live here for a while, and you, you learn stuff, and then you disappear, and everyone goes, was that all there was? And you go, 
man, there's more to this than we understand. But you see Jesus busting in on these guys with it. His divinity was hidden in his humanity, right? He had a humility, and that's what I love about the gospel story, because he's amazingly smart, but he's very humble. I love the fact that God isn't just walking around like, you know, arrogant and all cool. I'm the coolest in the universe. He actually was willing to be the lowest, the lowest, the lowest. He went to the people who were the least and the last and the lost. He was born in a barn. When people say, hey, well, close the door. You're born in a barn, son? He's like, yes. Um, actually, I uh, didn't even get a barn. Um, it was just a manger, right? <laughs> He's no stranger to the manger, right? What is the manger? It's mange, <laughs> mangy. It, it was dirty. It was a feed trough. He was born into an animal feed trough in the middle of a bummed out place called Bethlehem. And you go, I love it. But he was still an awesome God. And that's what you see in what he's doing here. He's reminding him, don't, don't, don't be fooled by my exterior. Remember who I am. I'm coming in my glory. And it's a sneak peek for a few faithful followers. They says, hey, VIP showing, guys. I just want to show you this. Because again, you're going to be treated like I am. I'm about to be destroyed. I'm about to be disgraced. I'm about to be you know, just beaten and, and, and mistreated. And it's going to happen to you sometimes too. If you follow me, not everyone's going to be impressed with you. Not everyone's a fan. And this is part of the, the message for today, and I want you to come back to this thought, so I'll say it again. History has always been nonprofit. Um, what, and I, yes, I spelled that wrong on purpose. Um, two ways of spelling it, right? Nonprofit. Think of the prophets. What is a prophet? A truth teller. Guess what? People don't like it. People don't like truth. I, not just Jesus. I'm talking about people throughout Peter, James, and John. They carried on in his place. People didn't like it. They crucified them too. Um, throughout history, they've been assassinated, uh, character assassinated, or physically assassinated. When people have stood for love and truth, let me assure you, people don't love truth. Not everyone. Some people do, but most of human history, nonprofit. Look across all cultures. When somebody comes and says, can't we all just get along? Boom, we're going to take them out. Why? Because people can't stand the truth. You can't handle the truth, right? But, but when you look at this, history has been nonprofit. So yeah, this preview is for all, but it's not G-rated. I hate to tell you, human history isn't. It is, man, you need parental guidance, right? At least. This was a preview of Jesus coming. Even his clothes were shining. I love that because he was able to transform not only from the inside, but what he was physically wearing changed and and again does that change push my mind yeah you go it sounds like science fiction to me well um you know i look at it and go most of science sounds like fiction to me when people explain things to me and they go well there's these things and they're spinning around and see that chair has more space than matter and actually somehow you sit on it even though um if you were to you know fall through the holes that are in between all of the molecules there, you'd be on the floor and you'd disintegrate. And you go, yikes. Um, you say, but we're actually 93 million miles away from the sun going such and such mile an hour at, at such and such tilt. And you go, you don't believe that, do you? And you go, aren't we seriously just a brain in a jar? I mean, you know, seriously, every experience that I've had in my life has only made me say, I'll believe anything, really. I mean, I'll believe everything. Anything is possible. And I look at this and I go, this is very possible. It's very plausible to me that if there was a God, if I was God and I made a world, I'd visit it. And you know what I'd do? I'd come stealth, just like Jesus did. I think it's fascinating. He came and he was treated like they would treat him if they didn't know he was God. Ha, exactly. I've used this reference before, but I want you to think about it. Undercover Boss, that was a show that played for a while, and it was fascinating because they'd take the CEO, they'd dress him up like a line worker, and they would get treated terribly by some of the workers and great by other workers. They didn't know who they were. So people's true character came out. This is exactly what I would do as a, if I was God. I would come, undercover God. I would come in, undercover boss, see how they treat you, because that's how you find out. Some people are like, ah, you're nobody. Oh, you're the boss. Oh, come on in. Oh, you know, and all that stuff. But when they think you're just the new guy, 
They treat you terrible. They delegate all the worst work to you. They criticize you, all this stuff. And you go, that was Jesus. It's amazingly fascinating thought. And so this is what you see. Two guys long gone from the earth, still very much alive. And this is what I want you to think about as we head into the section four, five, and six, verse four, five, and six, which is when we know the coming attractions, we can handle the present distractions. What's a distraction? Man, physical suffering, it's real, but it's real short. That's what the Bible basically says. Whatever you go through in life, it's not very long. And eternity is very long. So when I understand there's a coming attraction, I'm attracted to that and I'm not distracted by this. I go, man, this is so frustrating. And how long is it lasting? Four months. Okay, put that out against all of eternity. Well, four months isn't really that long, is it? And so these guys, Elijah and Moses, or who we see in verse four, they were talking with Jesus. They're just kind of chill. Uh, Elijah, Moses, yeah mention their names, but you realize Elijah and Moses, they were gone a long time back. This is in Mark, right? This is in the first century in Jerusalem, and you have people uh, like who've been dead in the Old Testament, Moses, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, by Moses, um, right? I mean, Moses is long gone. He didn't even make it to the promised land of Canaan. He's like out of the story in the prequel, right? I mean, super prequel people. And all of a sudden they're back chilling with Jesus. And you're like, uh, where did movie makers get their great ideas? Eh, they all rip things off in the Bible, don't they? Um, so the, the, you got these prequel guys suddenly showing up and having a little conference on the top of the hill there. And, and Peter's answers, <laughs> which think of the verb here, verse 5, Peter answered, nobody was talking with Peter, and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, blah, 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 because he did not know what to say, and they were greatly afraid. Verse 6 is amazing, because it says Peter didn't know what to say, so he said something. Uh, let this be a lesson to you in life. Um, let this be a lesson to me. Um, Peter, thank you for doing that because I do it too. But he had no idea what to say. So he said something. And no one was talking with him, but he answered anyway. Um, and, and I love that because Peter, Lord help whoever that is. Thank you for our first responders. Um, so he says something. The last time Peter spoke, he was rebuked by Jesus, but apparently he didn't learn his lesson. Last time he was said, get behind me, Satan, but he still feels emboldened to talk here anyway. Um, this would have been a great time to listen. If Moses and Elijah ever show up talking with Jesus at the foot of your bed, <laughs> you might want to listen in. Don't do too much talking, just kind of like, you know, open ears, closed mouth, right? This is great. Jesus, he says, let's build a tabernacle here. This is a, this is a concept that if you think it through in your own life, Jesus says, no, let's not. Um, remember, Peter's like, let's freeze this moment and live in the preview forever. And Jesus says, no, there's a coming attraction. I was just trying to give you a glimpse of it, but I wasn't trying to get you to build a monument to it. I wasn't trying to get you to freeze this moment and we could just put time in a bottle and all this stuff. And you go, no, 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 no. Break that bottle. You don't want to be stuck in time forever. There will be a time when you won't have to be stuck in a moment you can't get out of. See, even the good moments of this life are the worst moments of something else. The, the highlights here are the low lights of heaven. This is what Jesus is trying to get him to see. Hey, I'm giving you your best day ever here, but don't hold on to it. Because I can tell you, you'll look back and go, I was excited about that. I was excited about a tabernacle on the top of a mountain uh, when I could have been with Jesus forever. See, Moses and Elijah, I think this one's a really cool thought. Sometimes the simplest of thoughts Maybe you say, man, these are too simple for me. I, I'm way past this. But I think of this. We will meet Moses. Man, we will meet Elijah. We will meet Peter. He's probably going to be mad at me for some of the stuff I said about him. <laughs> Sorry, Pete. Um, and we get to meet Jesus. Man, add to that list whoever you're missing right now. If there's somebody who's exited this part of the story and you go, oh, gone forever. No, 
Apparently not. Moses and Elijah just show up like it's normal. <laughs> and, and you see here, they're just talking, and they're not like going, what am I doing back? They're just like, yeah, of course. I've, I'd never cease to exist. I just cease to exist here. And again, if these are things that are hard for you to believe or are you wrestle with them, I hope they are hard to believe and you wrestle with them. Because someone who just says, yeah, okay, I don't think it's taken the gravity of it in my life. I realize this is, yeah, yeah, grandma, definitely going to see you again, right? And, and, and put in a good word for me with these guys, you know? Um, ask them some questions, you know? And, and so thinking about what it is to meet these people, the people of history, I'm going to get to meet the people of history. And you might be someone someone's looking forward to meeting. Oh, no, I could never. Listen, there's people who your life is going to impact in such a way you have no idea what the significance of your life might be. There might be people a generation from now saying, I just can't wait to meet Billy Jones and thank him for, I never got to meet him, but I heard he was awesome, you know, and stuff like that. And he was, he is. But when you think about that, we look at these lives and go, oh, so significant. Well, Moses is a big deal. Elijah is a big deal. But the cloud came and overshadowed them, verse 7, and a voice came out from the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Um, you remember I said that was one of the things you're going to see in this chapter. It was a preview, right? And it came out just like I said it would. But he basically says not, hey, these are three big dudes here. Listen to them. He says, this is Jesus. Listen to him. Like Moses is listening to Jesus, right? Jesus isn't asking Moses, you got any advice for stuff? I'm really struggling here or whatever. A cloud came and overshadowed them. In the Old Testament, this cloud was called the Shekinah glory. It's a supernatural cloud for the presence of God. There, if they had the tabernacle, right, when there was a pillar of uh, cloud by day, fire by night, it's awesome because God, if you think about that, the presence of God became what they needed, right? When it was dark, he was the light. When it was light, he was the cloud that they could see even in the bright. He, he just led them in that physical way. And I love the Old Testament, but there's, I love the sequel even more because the, the Old Testament is like God's picture book. I don't know how else to put it. It's almost like, it's like K through six, right? And, and there's stuff in there that sometimes you're like, okay, there's lots of manipulatives. Everything's like lessons like that. And then you come to Paul and Paul writes a book like Romans and this is a college level class. I mean, this is not like, uh, you know, little felt uh, things of, of a guy throwing rocks at a giant and stuff like that. I believe those stories happened, but I'm just saying, you know, there's, there's the picture book, but then there's the, now in the New Testament, people are throwing rocks at God's people and they're actually the guy being buried and put off, you know? So sometimes the, the Old Testament stories, it's like God always wins, you know? But man, there's some chapters in the New Testament where it looks like God's not winning this one. You go, remember, there's a sequel. There's a sequel, right? But that's a, that's a greater upper division thought. And the, the Old Testament and New Testament, it's progressive thought. I think this is really important, that God didn't reveal everything in Genesis. He revealed everything in Genesis to Revelation. And one of the things he revealed in Revelation is, you ain't seen the rest. There's more after that. And you go, more beyond that? Yeah, that's eternity. And you go, he's only given us a tiny little preview. And you go, well, okay, I get it now. If Jesus had listened to Peter, that would have been a mistake. <laughs> if Peter had listened to Jesus, that would have been a good start. He would have understand the path to glory is paved with suffering. See, we talked about it last week. The crown, the, the, the crown is on the other side of the cross. And in God's economy, he's, he'll talk to you about the cross first. And he'll talk to you about the crown and what he's doing with these guys is giving them a glimpse of the next chapter in their life. He's basically saying, hey, it's going to get gory before you get glory. I don't know how else to put it to you, but there's going to be some difficulty in between. And the same cloud that filled the temple with God's glory, there were times when the priests would be doing stuff and it actually says in the Old Testament that God's glory overshadowed the thing and they're just like, they had to put their stuff down. They just couldn't do anything more. 
And this is basically what he's saying. He's like, Peter's like, blah, 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 whoa, glory of God. Um, and, and I can tell you in your life, in my life, there's times where God's cloud, God's glory just has to simply overshadow shadow, and overshadow and overshout what I think and what I say and what I do, where God's just got to be God. And he's just kind of like, well, I was thinking about this and here's what I would do in this case. And if I were God, I would do this with my personal work situation. And God goes, glory. And you just go, oh, ne ne never mind. This is what happened. He says, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. <laughs> Peter, you've said enough. Listen to him. And again, if I could say it, this part of what I'm hoping to do this summer is listen to him. Um, you know, I, by, by nature of my role in so many places in life, I end up talking a lot. And you say, amen, you do. Um, but what's funny about that is people who really know me know that I actually love not talking to anyone anywhere, anytime. I like to, I mean, my daughter's always like, dad, you're weird. Because uh, I, I love to go off and think and, and, and think for days and not say anything to anyone. Um, and, and so that's part of the thought here is that he took him aside not to talk, but to listen and have that in your life, you know, have it. It's an important thing. Um, notice the, the voice again says, my beloved son. And suddenly they looked around, they saw no one anymore, verse 8, but only Jesus with himself. And this shows us an obvious fact, right? I put it up here. Um, they still exist. They exist even though they died a long time before this, and they exist even now. I mean, Moses, he's out there, right? Elijah, he's still around. Um, you know, list your loved ones. They're still around. There's more to the scene than just that those who die still exist. There's a reason why these two came. There's a reason, I believe, theologically, it'll, it'll help you understand. Moses was the law, right? Moses was the law. He was the lawgiver. The Ten Commandments guy, right? Famous for that. That was his movie, right? You've seen it. And so Elijah didn't have a movie, but, it, but he has, uh, he had, some people have put out lesser known Elijah movies, but Elijah, um, he's the prophet. He is the prophet of prophets. So you've got the lawgiver of lawgivers, and the Old Testament is divided theologically into the law and the prophets. That's what they call it where it's like God gives a law and then he gives a prediction. There's going to be someone who comes who gives grace rather than law and he's still truth, but he's going to give you more than just what you're doing wrong, which is what Moses can do, Ten Commandments. Jesus is going to give you the two commandments, love God, love your neighbor, and he's going to enable you to do it. So the prophets had all the way along been pointing forward past Moses. Elijah's like, hey, you know, I'm not pointing back to Moses and say, this is the greatest thing ever. I'm, Moses was pointing forward to Jesus. The prophets are pointing forward to Jesus. And guess what? Now Jesus is there. And these guys revered Moses and Elijah. And they put them on the same, same side. They're like, let's make a tabernacle for each of you. And God says, let's have Moses and Elijah fade into the history books. And Jesus be the voice that remains. And when you think about what that means, it's a big deal. Moses, an important guy, but just a guy. Elijah, an important guy, but just a guy. But can I remind you, history's always been nonprofit. Neither of these guys had a particularly easy time. Moses had a terrible time. He was not respected in his day. He was constantly, by the people he was setting free and taking them from Egypt to the promised land, they were constantly saying, we liked it better in Egypt. We want to go back to where we were. Uh, we're going to pick a new leader. You're terrible. Why? Because he was telling them truth and they didn't like it. Elijah was a guy who was just pretty much cast aside by every king they came to. The king, he'd come to the kings and tell them, here's what God's trying to tell your kingdom. And they'd go, get rid of this guy to the dungeon with you and all this kind of stuff because he spoke truth. Bring in people who tell me what I love to hear. That was the entire of the Old Testament, right? And it's true of Jesus. It's going to be true of you. And when you think about what that means, if this was the only world there was, that'd be pretty discouraging. It's like, okay, live for truth, die. Uh, live for truth, be rejected. Live for significance, be insignificant. You know, and you go, wow, that's pretty frustrating. But guess what? In the sequel, in the sequel, the roles are reversed. 
And people who were nothing in this world will be everything in God's economy. And people who were everything here, oh man, people bowed down to their power. They will be powerless and they'll be taken away. And when I think about this, this is what Jesus is saying to them. He said so many times, it's not here and now that I'm trying to prepare you for. It's there and then. And so Jesus handpicked three people, but those three people went on to serve selflessly and they were sacrificed in the same way Jesus was. Acts 12, 2 tells us James was the first martyr in the church. He was the very first guy to die after Jesus did for following Jesus, right? And he was cut down with a sword by King Herod. That was the guy who basically did it. And so when you think about this, you have James, you have um, John, all of them died violent deaths. Peter was crucified according to history upside down. You know, I mean, just, you go, not really valued in their day. And what made them so faithful? I think it's this simple. They saw the preview. They saw the preview. They knew what the whole movie was. They knew that this was the, just the prequel, just a little thing. And they was like, oh, now I get it. And the more somebody has, you know, you've heard that saying maybe sometimes, oh, they're so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. That's not true at all. If somebody's truly heavenly minded, they're earthly good. Because this is a, a limited time to do something that lasts forever. Right? And this is what he says in verse 9. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things they'd seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the word to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. <laughs> uh, the funny thing is, I started this off by saying sometimes people have these really esoteric, bizarre interpretations of things when the obvious meaning is kind of the obvious meaning and so he, Jesus says I'm going to rise again from the dead and they went all right well we won't talk about it except amongst the three of us what do you think he meant by rising from the dead do you think he meant rising from the dead I don't know um you know and so he meant rising from the dead right that's what he meant from rising from the dead tell tell them at some point <laughs> don't tell them now and this is the last time that Mark mentions Jesus saying to keep quiet about this you know he, several times you've seen it if you paid attention he keeps saying don't tell anyone about this let me tell people about this don't tell everyone about this because he knew that they would mess up the message but you know what after Jesus came back they could tell the spoiler right? It's like, don't tell anyone until they've seen the, seen the movie, okay? Once they've seen the crucifixion and everything else, that's going to really do some things in people's hearts. And so tell them I'm coming back soon. Tell them they might want to stay tuned, but, but don't tell them all the details yet. I've shown you those for a reason. And then verse 11 is funny, and I, and I hope you can stick with it for just a minute, but I think it's worth speaking on for a moment. I most of the time what I try to do teaching wise is very applicational, but there's every once in a while that you got to get into really interpretation and say like, well, what does this mean anyway? And so they, they were asking him saying, why did the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Because this was a thing that is part of Jewish culture. In fact, it exists to this day. Verse 12, Jesus answered and told them, ah, indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things. And how is it written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? What he's asking them there is to consider the plot line because he says, how, how do you, uh, you ask me a question, let me ask you a question. He says, Elijah shows up in this movie, but he says, how can it be that the Messiah is cut off, but he's coming back? And he says, because it's split into two parts. It's a two-part movie. I mean, this is what he's trying to get him to see, that there's a coming and there's a second coming, and you're not going to get the whole plot in this one movie, right? It's a, it's a multi-movie plot that God's put together here. And so he says, yeah, Elijah. See, they'd grown up as good Jewish boys, and if you've been around uh, anyone of, of the Jewish faith, one of the things you'll know is that they always set a table at Passover for Elijah because Elijah's coming, right? Elijah might come to dinner. He might be at this Passover. If I've done Seder dinners, and it's amazing. I love all the imagery of the stuff, and, and it's not a us versus them. It's a us with them. I mean, do you understand? God, Jesus was Jewish, right? I, you can't be anti-Semitic and be a Christian, right? But, but you see him with this amazing thought, and he says, yeah, Elijah's come. They're like, 
Elijah, come. We miss him? He said, well, on the mountain you just saw him, right? But he said, he's come. And he makes an allusion to John the Baptist. I love this because this is what he tells him. Uh, you'll see it. He's talking about John the Baptist. He says, yeah, Elijah came. The Bible says in New, the New Testament books that John, ba John the Baptist came in the spirit and character of Elijah. So he's, what is it telling you? This is the application if you, if you chew on this when you go home and think about it. Every generation gets an Elijah. Every generation gets a Moses. Every generation gets a Jesus. Am I telling you Jesus is here physically right now? No, I'm not telling you that. What I'm telling you is prophets are there. People have spoken these things through all the time. And, and, and we get our John the Baptist and people have the same response to them today that they would have then. And so Jesus is saying, oh, yeah, Elijah comes. He comes in every generation. There's going to be a guy who's going to be a unconventional, and he, you know, he didn't look anything great because that's John the Baptist. John the Baptist was nothing to look at, and he was kind of quirky, and he's kind of strange. But guess what? A very small number of people went, this guy's telling the truth, man. Can't avoid that. And other people said, we got to get rid of this guy. we got to cut his head off because, remember, history is nonprofit. And this is what Jesus was telling him. He, Malachi 4, 5, it's a great prediction from the Old Testament. He says, I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great dreadful day of the Lord. He'll turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. What's he saying? He's saying, Elijah's going to be there. There's always going to be one. And there's going to be, a, Elijah himself, I believe, shows up in the book of Revelation. There's a time where it says, before the end of all things, two guys are showing up to tell everybody, and they, some will listen and some won't. Now, is it Moses and Elijah? I don't know. It's as likely as anybody. There's a lot of reasons, and if you read the book of Revelation, to think it is Moses and Elijah. He doesn't use their names. But you look at this and say, Scott, you're weird. No, this story is weird. But this truth is very important, which is in every generation, there will be prophets, and you'll either profit from it and take truth and do something with it and get to see one movie or you get to see the other movie. At every preview, there's always things I go, I don't want to see that. There's horror movies. If you're into horror movies, God bless you. I, I'm, I'm so glad. Life to me sometimes is a horror movie. I don't need any more of that nonsense. I, I look at the daily news and I'm like, that's enough horror for me. But you know what? There's movies I'm like, I've seen enough of that. And what I say that several people are sometimes like, Scott, do you, do you believe in heaven? I do. Do you believe in hell? I do. I don't want to, but I do. And if I, there's a heaven, there's a hell. And guess what? Jesus talked about it, and I've seen enough preview of both to know which movie I want to see. Okay? I, you'll, if you're around me, I am not a hell guy. I'm not like always, ah, this and scaring people out of hell and everything. I, I don't believe that's effective. But what I do look at it and say, there's two comings of Jesus that things are here, and the second time he comes, he's not coming the same way he came the first time. The, he's coming to say, what, what, what decision do you want us to do? What movie did you want to see? What preview were you interested in? Man, I want to preview heaven. Everybody I meet, I want to bring a little bit of foretaste of heaven if I can to their life. I don't want people saying, yeah, man, being around Scott, I get a little foretaste of hell. Um, hey, there's enough of that. But there's a place where the presence of God is. And what hell is, if you want my definition, is it's the absence of all things God. So God is somewhere, and I want to be with him. If he's not there, it's everything he isn't. I do not want anything to do with it. I know enough to know I don't want to know anymore. But I know enough that I want to know more about heaven. That's how easy it is for me. Elijah and Moses, I'd like to meet them. I know where they are. They're with Jesus. What decisions did they make? Well, I look at the decisions they made. They made the decision to be unpopular sometimes in their day, but popular with God. And so when you see this, they left a seat for him. And notice what it says, verse 13. They did to him whatever they wished. That's what Jesus said. Who? Look up a prophet anywhere in the Old Testament and ask yourself, did they ever treat him right? Did, has anyone ever said, by and large, has the majority ever treated truth right? Um, you know, I'll go even on, as far as saying, like, 
I love one of the U2 songs I love draws a parallel between Jesus and uh, Martin Luther King and, uh, you know, and, and it's, we always kill our prophets. <laughs> we always kill our prophets. You look at this thing, was it, was it, what happened in John the Baptist's life? Well, he was killed. He was beheaded. It's a reminder to the servants of God. They have always been mistreated by the world, but always well treated by God. And, the, and when you think about this, Elijah has already come. John the Baptist, Herod cut his uh, head off. Was it worth it? Yeah, it was worth it for him. Uh, Moses, Moses put up with a multitude of grumbly people all the way through the desert and wandered in the wilderness, even though he wasn't the disobedient one. And you go, well, was it worth it? Yes. And the point of the preview is you're going to like the movie. If you like the preview, the worst scenes of this life are, the, are better in eternity. And so I think about what, what a transformation is. I'm going to leave you a, a verse out of the New Testament to think on, and then we're done, which is Romans 12, 2. It's the same word for transfiguration. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, be transfigured, be metamorphosis by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. There's another one in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It uses it again. It says, we all with unveiled face, behold as in a mirror the glory of God, are being transformed, transfigured, metamorphosis into the same image by the Spirit of God. What is it saying? It's saying you can have a transfiguration too. This is kind of the applicational charge for this, which is John and James and Peter. They were taken up on a mountainside with Jesus and they got to see Moses and Elijah and that was a really cool preview and everything. We can read about that and go, well, I want to be there. But the truth is the New Testament tells us where we are is better than where they were because we have a better understanding than they did. We have all of history to look back on, including theirs. They were living out the movie and they didn't even know what the next step was, but we can look back at their life and see how it ends. And I look at it and say, you know what? I can be transfigured. I can be transformed. I can be metamorphosized by the spirit of God to where it's not, you know, me like ripping aside my shirt and a beam of glory comes out. Although if I did that, you know, this place would be packed next week, <laughs> right? If I could do that. But what if, what if we just shown the love of Christ through us wherever we go? This is what he's saying, that you can take that one <laughs> out of the church, out of the tabernacle. It'd be good to build a tent and just live in that glory. He says, no, it'd be great to go down into the valley and take that light with you. This is what Jesus was always about. And if you look at the rest of the chapter, which I hope you will, this is what they do. They come down from here, from the mountain, back to the reality, the gritty reality of everyday life on earth. Some of the toughest times, but they had a preview of coming attractions, and it kept them from getting bogged down in all the distractions. They'll do the same for us. So, Lord, I thank you for this chapter. I thank you for these verses. Pray that we would wrestle through them as we should. And just if we can remember a simple thought that uh, this is not all there is, and it will be fleeting. Uh, it will be something that we will look back on from the perspective of eternity and say, I was worried about that. And I wasn't focused on that. Uh, and so help us to have some degree of capacity to have the future be part of our present perspective. And we pray it in Jesus' name.